Hi, I'm Michael Duffy from Time Magazine, and we're here today with Carl Rove, the author of Courage and Consequence. And our readers have sent some questions in, Carl, and we thought we'd just let you go at them. Ready? Count away. Carl, I get the first question, actually. Uh, what did you learn when you wrote this book? Anything big you can sort of leave as a takeaway that you learned yourself? Well, I learned a lot, uh, you know, because when you're when you're living through it, you 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 have the advantage of of immediacy and intimacy, but you don't have as much perspective as you might have. For example, chapter twenty one, where I write about the Democrat charge that Bush lied about the weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. in Iraq, it, it did not dawn on me until I reconstructed the event that this was a concerted effort by the Democrats. This was not something they stumbled into. Ted Kennedy on July 15th of 2003 gives a speech. Tom Daschle holds a news conference that afternoon. John Kerry repeats the charge in a speech the next day. John Edwards repeats the charge in a committee hearing. And Jane Harmon puts out a statement at the end of the day. So in, the, in, the, in, in 48 hours, five of the leading voices of the Democratic Party on foreign policy launched the same attack. Obviously, there was some coordination, but at the time, you know, you're flowing through it so quickly you don't see it. And I saw that a lot as I went through here, it just putting things in perspective as to, you know, being able to step back and look at it, a little bit of the flow and uh, the ebb of events. Gary Owen, who read the book uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, asks, uh, what has been the uh, biggest obstacle uh, that you've overcome in your life after having sort of taken account of it in the way you have in uh, Courage and Consequences? Is there something that uh, s stepped out as, as, as sort of stands out that way? Well, it's funny. People have reacted to the first chapter or two of this by saying, God, you've, you overcame a lot in your life. Well, I, it, it didn't seem to me at the time. And uh, so, I mean, um, I, I guess the biggest one is that I never got a college degree. But I mean, people have taken away an unusual lesson from one and two, which is that I had some kind of a difficult childhood which required me to overcome big obstacles. And it's funny, I don't remember it that way. I mean, it's, I shared the kind of things that happened to my family. And I grew up on the sort of, as I say, on the shabby side of the middle class. But I had a great childhood in many respects. Uh, looking back, what do you think historians will say was uh, President Bush's greatest achievement? And what do you think they'll say his biggest mistake was? I think he, they will say his greatest uh, achievement was uh, to put America on uh, the right footing to win and prevail in the global war on terror, which will shape the, this century that we find ourselves in. I think they will say his greatest failing was his inability to, in a second term, put all of the debris of the 2000 election behind us, all the bitter feelings that had lingered even after 9-11, and to put them behind them and to bring the country together to achieve fundamental reforms on Social Security and immigration. We came close on immigration. We came close, and, and, and one of the things in the, story, in the book that I wanted people to understand the true story was, we were this close to getting comprehensive immigration. We had 90 some odd amendments stacked up so that opponents and proponents could have a chance to make the bill better. And one person, Harry Reid, without consulting with Ted Kennedy or the Republican sponsors of it, jerked it down. And the only way to bring it back up was to narrow the number of amendments to, I believe it was five, under Senate rules. And then we lost that moment. Raymond Law of Stewart, Florida, asks you, what do you think of the current Tea Party movements and uh, their potential? The Tea Party movement is very interesting because it is grassroots and f highly decentralized. I try and seek these people out as I go around the country. Like, I met the woman who organized the Tea Party in front of Nancy Pelosi's office. Stay-at-home mom. She'd started out as an attorney in a sort of middle-range law firm in San Francisco, got married, started to have kids, stepped away from the law. When her kids got sort of preteen teens, she started practicing law, getting out of her house, and literally ran off the flyers on her home computer, saying, "If you're wired up like I am about what you see going on in Washington, show up in front of our congresswoman's office." And people showed up. So what I find about them is is that they are people who have heretofore been largely spectators, not participants. I went to a Tea Party meeting in Southern Delaware. Met with 12 Tea Party leaders. They'd chosen three of their number to speak. One was the grizzled Vietnam veteran who was missing half his teeth and wearing his biker outfit. He rode around on a motorcycle. The radio oncology nurse from the local hospital and the stay-at-home mom. And none of them had ever done anything politically before. Fascinating. Yeah. Brent Cantor of New York City asks, who are the Republican leaders who you believe would make the strongest candidates in 2012? You know, I, I don't think we know yet. Several geological ages are going to come and go. <laughs> I mean, think about this point in 2006. Who was saying in April of 2006, Barack Obama? So I, I'm focused on 2010. There are a number of people out there. You've got Romney and Palin and Pawlenty and Mitch Daniels. You potentially have a Newt. You potentially have Haley Barber. And I think there's going to be somebody emerge from this election. We haven't seen yet. That we haven't seen yet and that we haven't really considered in that. Kind of a player to be named later. Right. Lastly, 
And this is my, this is a question for me. What are you going to do next? After this book tour ends, if it ever ends. Well, if it ever ends, <laughs> it feels like it's the never-ending book tour. Uh, you know, I've got an interesting, I, I've, I'm a commentator for Fox. Um, I write for the Wall Street Journal, which is the most challenging thing I do because I never understood how hard it was to say something that people might want to read and say it in 775 words or less. You're getting good at it. Better and, at it. Uh, yeah, well, and uh, thanks. And then uh, writing for Newsweek. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm on the speaking tour, and then I'm doing some stuff, you know, in politics, sort of low-key, under the radar. Who stay here? I split my time already. I've, I'm uh, Texas and Austin uh, in, in, in Washington, so. Great. Let's split my time. I think that'll do it. Yeah, great. Thank well, you thanks for having me. Okay.